Today we will speak about the spinal reflexes. Can you see my first slide now? Yes. Okay, yeah. fine. So uh, we will start with with the general description of um, of an of a ref reflex arc. Um, and uh, we also have to define what do we understand about, um, about a reflex, yeah, under a reflex. So as you can see here in these pictures, for example, the reflex is an autonomic response to a stimulus, and this is actually an involuntary movement. Yes, for example, if you touch a hot object, you, you will pull your arm, uh, backward, and um, this is uh, a reaction which uh, stays actually under the level of consciousness. Later, it will be also it will also get conscious, but this is a very fast reaction. Uh, and as you can see in this picture, we have several components of a of a reflex arc. Um, the first one is the receptor. The receptor receives the stimuli, in this case, a pain, for example, but the stimulus can be different. Then the receptor is actually the peripheral process of an afferent neuron, of a sensory neuron. And these sensory neurons are always located in, in, in a ganglion, in a sensory ganglion, uh, in a spinal ganglion, for example. And uh, as you can see, the central process of this afferent leads to the CNS and um, uh, now in the spinal cord and uh, relays on a, on a motor neuron. And this motor neuron, the axon of this motor neuron is called efferent or motor fiber, which then terminates in an effector. And this effector is, is a muscle or a gland. Yes, in most of cases, um, the effector is the skeletal muscle, but we will see that also smooth muscles or glands can be the effectors. And this schematic drawing shows that this information also will reach the brain. So almost all of the reflexes get conscious so then we reach the cerebral cortex, but uh, only after a while. So at first comes the reaction, and after then uh, we can also be aware of it. Um, we can classify the reflexes in more groups, and uh, here you can see uh, what are these main groups uh, we will discuss today. So we can distinguish proprioceptive reflexes, these are also called stretch reflex or myotatic reflex, or we can have nociceptive reflexes, autonomic reflexes, and, and also mixed reflexes. And there are many differences between these uh, reflexes um, according to the location of, of the receptors, effectors, according to the type of the afferent and efferent uh, fibers. And uh, as you can see, uh, the number of uh, synapses varies uh, also. So uh, we will start with this uh, stretch reflex. And this drawing shows it. And uh, at first, you have to understand what is the uh, stretch reflex. I think you already uh, have learned about it. So as you can see in this uh, uh, picture, if a muscle uh, gets stretched, then the muscle will contract. So this is uh, the response of the muscle um, um, of, of uh, the stretching of the muscle. So this simple reflex is very important. It has a biological function, but at first we will discuss the different parts <clears throat> of the ref reflex arc, and then we will summarize the biological functions of this reflex. Yes, but the name comes uh, from uh, the location of the receptors and effectors. So proprio means um, that um, the stimulus and the response is are in the same organ, so in, in the muscle. We have both the receptor and the effector in the muscle itself. 
Uh, so uh, if we <coughs> would um, follow the arc of the reflex, the receptors are the muscle spindles with the anorospiral endings of the afferent. Um, and the adequate stimulus of these receptors is the stretching of the muscle. Yeah, it's very important <coughs> for stretching. Then the afferents, the endings of which are actually these uh, anospiral endings, are very thick myelinated, so 1A, or that's the same like A alpha fibers. And as you can see in the picture, the uh, nuclei are located in the dorsal root ganglion, and the central processes will relay on, directly onto a motor neuron here. So we, we only have one single synapse here in this reflex arch, and the efferent, that means the um, motor fiber, goes back to the same muscle where we also have the receptors, and these are the motor end plates, and the response will be the contraction of the muscle, in this case, the extension in the knee. Yes, so if a muscle gets stretched, it will be contracted. That's the uh, reflex. But we will see that um, it is only possible, so we only have one synapse, it is only possible if uh, the antagonist of the muscle get relaxed and um, as you can see here, um, it is done by an inhibitory interneuron, which uh, can then inhibit the alpha motor neurons, which uh, innervate uh, the antagonist muscle, in this case, the hamstring muscles. And finally, it is also important that this information will also reach the brain. Later you will learn it in which pathway, in the so-called Ozakam pathway, so the reflex get conscious as well. But let's speak a little bit about these components in detail, yes, starting with the receptors. Uh, these receptors are, uh, as I mentioned, the muscle spindles. What are these muscle spindles? Uh, these are found inside of a skeletal muscle. As you can see in this picture, the muscle contains actually two types of muscle fibers, which are parallelly arranged to each other. So the extra fusal fibers, you already know, these are the fibers which uh, are innervated by the alpha motor neurons. So these fibers have only a motor innervation. But, uh, as you can see, we also have these intrafusal fibers which form the muscle spindle. These are also surrounded by a connective tissue capsule. And these intrafusal fibers uh, are innervated both sensory and motor. So, uh, if you check this um, schematic drawing, the end parts of the intrafusal fibers uh, contain the motor uh, endings, the motor terminals, and these terminals are the axon terminals of the gamma motor neurons. Yes, gamma motor neurons are located in the ventral horn of the spinal cord as well, but these are not as thick fibers as the alpha fibers. And the middle parts of the intrafusal fibers uh, contain the sensory endings. So these fibers have also a sensory innervation. We have two types of terminals. Uh, more important for us are the anulospiral endings. These are also very thick myelinated fibers. A, so 1A fibers, that's the same like A alpha actually. And these are um, the surrounding middle parts of these intrafusal fibers. And these are the receptors actually for the stretch reflex. And the adequate stimulus is, as I mentioned, the stretching of the intrafusal fiber. But we also have another type of sensory endings called flower spray endings. Uh, these are also thick myelinated. We will speak about it later. Uh, they have a function in, in the uh, tension uh, reflex. 
Uh, and as you can see, we, morphologically, we can distinguish two types of the intrafusal fibers, the so-called nuclear bag and nuclear chain fibers, but both are innervated by these annular spiral endings. And the details of these fibers you will learn in physiology. So um, we mentioned that the reflex is activated by the stretching of the um, of the intrafusal fibers, but how can it be? Uh, how, how can it happen? So we have actually two possibilities: either the entire muscle gets stretched, and that, that and that is what we do in the in these examinations. Um, but you can also see here. So in case of the patella reflex, for example, and this is used for diagnostic purpose. So that is one of the possibilities. Or if uh, we have a sudden movement, when a, when a muscle gets stretched suddenly, and then this is actually the protecting mechanism that this uh, stretch reflex uh, protects the muscle against the overstretching. So <clears throat> in this case, also the entire muscle gets stretched and then um, comes to the reflex. But in reality, um, uh, in most cases, the reflex are activated not like this, but um, in another way, that means that <clears throat> the intrafusal fibers uh, can be also stretched without the stretching of the entire muscle. Uh, how is it possible? Uh, it is visible in this um, schematic drawing about, again, about this intrafusal fibers. So what happens actually, um, as I mentioned, the motor endings, the gamma motor endings are at the end parts of the, on the end parts of this intrafusal fibers. And when these end parts of the intrafusal fibers get contract, then as a consequence, the middle part will be stretched, yes? So <clears throat> that will be then the adequate stimulus for this uh, annular spiral endings. So the stretch reflex can be activated also like this without the uh, stretching of the entire muscle. And that is what we call gamma loop. And in the next slide, I will show it again how it is actually regulated. So gamma motor neurons are located in the ventral horn of the spinal cord. And if you follow this uh, schematic drawing, they activate, they contract the end parts of the intrafusal fibers. As a consequence, this middle part um, will be stretched and then the stretch reflex starts Yes, that's that yellow uh, line represent, represents the um, sensory neuron. The central process goes uh, to the uh, spinal cord and um, synapses on directly on an alpha motor neuron, which then will contract the extrafusal fiber. Yes, so that's the uh, so-called gamma loop. That means that the contraction of the skeletal muscle is evoked by the stretching of the um, intrafusal fiber. And it's also important to mention that these um, gamma neurons and also the alpha motor neurons actually are always activated by descending pathways. Yes, you will learn about it in details later, which are these pathways, but these um, neurons can be only activated uh, by the central uh, descending pathways. So if we do not have these pathways, the reflex cannot be evoked. This drawing shows actually <clears throat> again, yes, can you see the so-called vestibulospinal tract or reticulospinal tract <clears throat> are two typical pathways which terminate here on the gamma motor neurons and activate the gamma motor neuron. And if you follow this red line, the gamma motor neuron innervates uh, the end parts of the intrafusal fibers. As a consequence, the annular spiral endings will be stimulated by stretching of the intrafusal fiber. And then 
we have the reflex. Yes, here you can see that the alpha motor neurons are activated, and then it the response will be the contraction of the extrafusal fiber. So this is what we call gamma loop. And it has a very <coughs> important uh, function. So <coughs> the biological importance of the stretch reflex, <coughs> we have to continue with. So <coughs> caused by this gamma loop, actually. Uh, <coughs> so that is um, probably you, you have heard about it, about it already that the muscles have a muscle tone, a resting muscle tone. Um, and it means that the muscles are partially contracted uh, also in rest, yes, during the resting state. And this muscle tone is maintained through this stretch reflex. Uh, this resting tone you can, for example, uh, recognize here in, in, in a newborn baby, you can see that the flexor muscles have a relative um, increased muscle tone or here flexors of the lower limb. Or if you examine someone, um, this passive movement of a limb, uh, you, you will feel the resistance during, the, during moving the the joint, and this is also due to this resting muscle tone. And this resting muscle tone only disappears if we uh, fall asleep or if we collapse. You can see here uh, that um, the muscle will then decline and also disappear. So with the aid of this stretch reflex, we can keep the length of the muscle and this is very important mechanism because with this mechanism we can protect the muscle against the passive forces for example gravitation yes uh, if you imagine uh, this um, standing posture can be also only kept if we have this reflex because with this contraction of the muscle the position of the joints will be fixed and the body posture can be kept. So uh, mainly the extensor muscles are involved. So the so-called anti-gravitation muscles, for example, the quadriceps femoris on the lower limb or the extensors of the back, these deep back muscles or muscles of the neck or also the chewing muscles. And um, uh, also, during movements, uh, the reflex is very important. Uh, you can imagine it as well if you, for example, want to lift a heavy object, what uh, would happen if we didn't have this reflex? Yes, this, this weight would pull uh, your limb, would, uh, the weight would, uh, would um, stretch the muscle, uh, and this passive stretch um, could... Um, uh, act against the movement. So with this reflex, uh, we have we, we can um, have a resistance against this passive stretch, and the movement, the muscle contraction, uh, will be improved like this. And as I mentioned, it is also a protecting mechanism against the overstretching of the muscles. For example, the triceps muscle can be. Uh, overstretched. Uh, there is also a so-called alpha-gamma coactivation uh, in, in, during the movements. Uh, I try to explain it uh, with the aid of these pictures. So uh, on the left side, you can see the biceps muscle relax, and then uh, what happens if the muscle contracts? It has also a consequence. Um, relating the uh, stretch reflex. Um, what I mean uh, is that, uh, as you can see here, in a relaxed muscle, the intrafusal fibers are um, uh, tense. But uh, if you carry out a movement, if you contract a muscle, the muscle will shorten. And as a consequence, the intrafusal fibers will get loose. 
in a contracted muscle. And, and then comes the gamma motor neurons, yes. What happens? The gamma motor neurons contract these end parts of the intrafusal fibers and uh, the middle part will be again tense. And um, then it means that actually the length of the intrafusal fiber is adjusted by the gamma motor neuron and the muscle spindles remain then excitable uh, also during contracted during a contracted muscle. So that means in every state of contraction, they remain excitable. So that is what uh, alpha gamma coactivation is. So the alpha motor neurons um, are supported by the gamma motor neurons and the length of the muscle will always uh, follow the length of the muscle spindle. And that is the mechanism which um, the date of which the movements will become harmonic. So that means that um, if you imagine it, um, in most cases, we do not stretch actively the muscles to activate the stretch reflex. So these gamma loops are which activate the stretch reflex mainly. So gamma loops are constantly circling in, in the body uh, if we are awake. What are these accessory components? Um, in this stretch reflex. First, the so-called reciprocal inhibition I've already mentioned with the relaxation of the antagonist. Yes, you can see it in this picture what happens. So we can see again the stretch reflex here, uh, which uh, uh, activates, which contracts the so-called agonist, for example, the quadriceps muscle, but if you follow this afferent fiber, you can see that we, we have collaterals which um, relay on association neurons, which then uh, will reach an other segment, other segments of spinal cord, because the antagonist muscles are innervated not by the same segment as the agonists. Um, and that's why in this case, the axons will descend to reach another segment and they will relay on an inhibitory neuron and the inhibitory neurons will then um, um, inhibit the alpha motor neurons, uh, the axons of which innervate the antagonist. So it is a very important accessory component of the stretch reflex that the antagonists get uh, relaxed. Otherwise, we couldn't um, carry out the contraction. And in this picture, you can see the same. Yes, in, in, this is the example of triceps and biceps muscle. So for example, if you extend your elbow if, and then the triceps muscle is contracted, as you can see here, um, but the collaterals of the afferents will activate the inhibitory neurons, which inhibit the motor neurons uh, for the biceps. So this is responsible for the relaxation of the biceps. Or if you contract the biceps muscle, that means, means if you bend your elbow, then the biceps will be contracted, but the triceps will relax. Uh, sometimes we have uh, movements when Antagonists and agonists are contracted at the same time. For example, in, in, in this rigid postures, um, in plank position, for example. Uh, and how is it possible? Uh, the um, descending pathways make, make it possible because these descending pathways can inhibit these inhibitory neurons. These are also called Renshaw cells, these inhibitory neurons. And uh, if the motor neurons won't be inhibited, the muscles can contract. But we also have other uh, accessory components. So we have inhibitory mechanisms which inhibit the uh, contraction of the muscles uh, during the reflex. What are these mechanisms? 
The first one is visible here. So <clears throat> this is the alpha motor neuron, which uh, goes to the extrafusal fiber. And as you can see, collaterals of uh, the axons of these uh, alpha motor neurons uh, turn back and activate inhibitory motor in inhibitory interneurons, so the Renshaw cells, which inhibit the same motor neuron. And this mechanism is called recurrent inhibition. So this is actually a negative feedback loop, uh, which can um, coordinate the um, intensity, intensity of the contraction. Or another mechanism is the Golgi tendon reflex. Uh, the Golgi tendon organs are located at the border between the muscle and the tendon. These are also receptors, also thick myelinated, so endings of thick myelinating fibers, 1B, or these are also actually A alpha fibers. Or we also have these secondary endings of the um, uh, of the intrafusal fibers, these are the flower uh, spray endings, and both receptors um, get activated by tension of muscles, so not by the stretching, like the annular spiral endings, but uh, by tension. And if you follow this line, you can see what happens. Uh, sorry. Um, these fibers will also uh, relay on these inhibitory neurons, which will also motor neurons. So that means if the muscle contraction is too uh, strong, this mechanism can uh, prevent the too um, intensive contraction with this mechanism. Inhibitory effects have also the descending pathways, pyramidal tract or this uh, reticulospinal tract. You will learn about it, the pathways um, in the following lectures. So these a pathways terminate also on inhibitory neurons, which can also inhibit the alpha motor neurons. So all these mechanisms are important in preventing too much uh, tension, or they can also regulate the muscle force. And in this picture, you can see the same if you follow the reflex, the reflex arc, starting with uh, supraspinal influences, which activate the gamma neurons at first. This is this uh, yellow line, uh, and the contraction of the intrafusal fiber will activate the annulospiral endings. You can see here with this blue line, it um, relays directly on the alpha motor neuron, which contracts the muscle. And then as a accessory component, the uh, secondary endings uh, will um, activate the inhibitory neurons, which then uh, inhibit the alpha motor neurons, so the muscle will relax. And it also has an importance, um, uh, so these um, um, inhibitory mechanisms, uh, have an importance because they can protect the muscle against the extreme or long-lasting tensions. For example, if you want to lift a very heavy object, which you cannot uh, do, um, it can happen then uh, what you can see in the picture. So in case of an extreme tension, the muscle will suddenly relax. But this is actually a, a, an inhibitory and protecting mechanism. With this um, um, inhibitory mechanisms, we can coordinate the, the, the movements. So this fine uh, coordination of voluntary movements are possible. Or we can do it also consciously. So if we carry out stretching exercises, we can uh, switch off this reflex. If the stretching lasts more than 15 seconds, the reflex will disappear and you can stretch the muscle. Uh, and this could be also very important uh, if we want to uh, prevent the shortening of muscles uh, during, um, because muscles um, tend to shorten uh, in, in a sitting position, so if we are sitting uh, for a long time, so it can be compensated by stretching exercises. 
And what are the clinical aspects of these uh, um, stretch reflexes? Uh, as you can see in the picture, if the reflex arc uh, has a lesion somewhere, uh, either on the afferent or on the afferent part, the reflexes cannot be evoked anymore. And <clears throat> It leads to hypotonia if uh, we do not have any resting muscle tone, and if, then we won't be able to adapt to gravity, and that is called flaccid palsy. As you can see in these pictures, what happens if we do not have this resting uh, muscle tone? We cannot keep our posture. Or um, if we have a lesion of a descending pathway, so it is, for example, in stroke, um, then what happens, then uh, these inhibitory neurons won't be activated. And that's why um, what happens is that the reflexes will be overactive and we will have a muscle hypertonia. That means the resting tone tone will be increased, and that is called spastic palsy. Typically, it, uh, it appears typically in stroke. Or, um, what I actually already mentioned, uh, even we can also uh, use this reflex for diagnostic purpose if we want to determine the level of a lesion uh, of a spinal cord, of a root, of a spinal root, uh, and the most common examination is the patellar reflex. Um, then in this case, uh, uh, we strike uh, with the reflex hammer uh, on the uh, patella tendon, and then the quadriceps muscle will be stretched, and as a reaction, as, as a response, the muscle will be contracted, and uh, we will see the extension of the knee joint. So uh, if this uh, reflex cannot be evoked, then is, is the lesion about at the level of L2 or L3, 4. So we can determine the level of a lesion with this uh, examination. And similar examination is the Achilles reflex. Um, if it is um, not, um, it, if it doesn't function, then is the lesion a little bit deeper, but we have similar re reflexes on the upper limbs, so triceps, biceps reflexes has uh, have the same uh, purpose. But now let's further to the next type of the reflexes, and that's the uh, nociceptive reflex. And you will see that uh, we will see the activation of the flexor muscles in this case. So uh, this is also called flexor or withdrawal reflex. And uh, the aim of this reflex is to protect the body from damaging stimuli. For example, as you can see in this picture, if you touch a hot object, we will pull our um, arm back and uh, it protects uh, the skin. And you will see that uh, in this case, the receptors are not in the muscle, but in the, on this, in the skin. And we have other differences, but in the next slide, I will uh, speak about the parts of the reflex arc in details. Yes, so uh, this example shows um, what happens if we step on, an, on a needle, for example. So the stimulus is always a pain. Yes, a pain. That's the adequate stimulus for the receptors, for the so-called nociceptors. Pain can be a mechanical or thermal or also chemical uh, pain exists. Uh, and this... Um, the sectors are actually the uh, nerve terminals of uh, afferent neurons, and the aff these afferent fibers are, in this case, very thin myelinated or unmyelinated. So um, 
not like in the stretch reflex. In the stretch reflex, the afferents are always thick myelinated. Here, not thin myelinated or thin or unmyelinated fibers. But the cell bodies, we can also we can find here also, also in the dorsal root ganglia. And as you can see, the central processes um, enter the spinal cord, and these arrows show that lots of neurons um, will be activated and we will have lots of synapses. So this reflex arc is polysynaptic. And at the end, the alpha motor neurons uh, will be activated in this case as well. So the effectors are, in this case, the muscles again, the skeletal muscles, as you can see in the picture. And it is very typical that uh, if, if we have um, the um, um, lower limb, so if the reflex is evoked by the uh, lower limb, then typically the on the ipsilateral slide, side, we will have deflection. So the flexor muscles will be activated on the ipsilateral side. On the contralateral side, the extensors are mainly activated. Uh, it, this is very important to keep the balance here. Yes? So uh, if you lift your right um, leg, uh, you have to keep the balance with the left leg. And that's the reason why uh, on the other side, also the flexors will, must be a little bit uh, contracted uh, to keep um, uh, the um, balance. So, uh, and, and also here we, we have this recip re uh, reciprocal inhibition. That means that uh, on the ipsilateral side, now the extensors must be relaxed. And if you follow these arrows, you can see what actually, uh, so how actually it is done. So these afferents will um, reach interneurons and these interneurons are partly association cells, yes, because here we also have to reach more segments because all these muscles are innervated by different segments. And as you can see, uh, the association neurons um, co um, connect the neighboring segments with each other. And we will also need commissural fibers because also the contralateral side must be innervated, as you can see here. And at the end, we will also need um, inhibitory neurons uh, for relaxation of the antagonist muscles. So in this case, we have an, an ipsilateral flexion and contralateral extension. And these uh, fibers of um, the different interneurons uh, run uh, in the so-called proper fasciculus. This is <clears throat> located on the surface of the <clears throat> spinal cord, and it, con it contains many vertical um, uh, running axons. And this reflex can be also used for diagnostic uh, purpose, purposes. For example, the abdominal reflex <clears throat> or the cremasteric reflex. Uh, probably you have heard about these reflexes uh, already uh, stroking the skin, for example, around the umbilicus. Um, the abdominal muscles will contract or in case of the cremasteric reflex, if you stroke the superior media part of the thigh, the ipsilateral cremaster muscle will contract and will pull up the testis. Uh, and these reflexes can be also used for testing the segments of the spinal cord. Yes, as you can see here, uh, T7, from T7 to L1, we can uh, test these segments with the abdominal reflex or with the cremasteric reflex the segments between L1 and 2. Or it can also happen that um, primitive reflexes appear. And uh, that's the case, for example, in central lesions in stroke. Uh, and uh, the so-called Babinski sign uh, can 
um, appear. That means if you uh, stroke the skin, the sole of the skin, um, um, in this uh, way, like uh, you can see it in the picture, then normally the um, toes will be flected. But um, if we can see the extension of the hallux, uh, this is the positive Babinski sign, and that is what uh, appears um, normally in infants, in, in newborn babies, but um, um, also if we have a central lesion. And the last type of reflexes is the reflex. Uh, this is what you can see now schematically. In this case, the preceptors are located in internal organs. Yes, and for example, in the stomach, like in this picture, you can see. And the afferents are in this case also very thin myelinated or unmyelinated fibers. And if you follow this blue line, you can see that the uh, cell bodies are located in the dorsal root ganglia. The central processes lead to the uh, spinal cord. And we also have here lots of interneurons in this case. So this reflex arch is also polysynaptic. The afferents, which are represented by these red lines, um, are interrupted always in case of an autonomic reflex. That means that the preganglionic fiber, that is the fiber of the first visceromotor neuron located in the lateral horn or in the intermediate zone, uh, will terminate uh, in a ganglion. This is actually a B fiber, yes, so uh, typically uh, preganglionic fibers are type B fibers, and they terminate in the autonomic ganglia, for example, in sympathetic ganglia, but in case of parasympathetic ganglia in, in the wall of the organs. And the um, second neurons, the processes, the axons of the second neurons are called postganglionic fibers, which then uh, reach the target organ. And these target organs are, in this case, smooth muscles or cardiac muscle or glands. Yes, smooth muscles we can find in the wall of the vessels, in the wall of the organs, or also in the skin, uh, the arctopili muscle. And glands are also naturally found both in, in internal organs or in the skin. So, for example, if if we have a if we have a stomach ache, it can reflectory um, lead to a, a muscle contraction of the um, of the stomach. And finally, we can have also mixed reflexes. That means reflex arches both with somatic and um, and visceral components. An example could be the so-called viscerocutaneous reflex. Uh, what does it mean if we have, for example, a disease of an organ, of a heart, for example, or an inflammation of the gallbladder? Then, uh, as a response, we can have a skin symptoms, for example, erythema of the skin in the so-called dermatomes. Yes, dermatomes are the uh, to organs related uh, skin areas um, where then we. Uh, where then also pain can uh, be radiated uh, in, in case of this um, reflex. If you check these lines, you can understand how it uh, uh, happens. Yes, so from the organ, we have the visceral, which then um, uh, lead into the uh, central nervous system, and with the aid of interneurons, the visceral, uh, so it is then related to. Um, and that's the somatic component to alpha motor neurons. And if you follow this axon, you can see that this alpha motor neurons go to the intercostal muscles, for example, in this case, or, or from the from the same um, uh, skin area, the sensory fibers will enter the same segment. And um, that's the reason why we can have also pain in, um, in along the dermatomes in case of a, a disease of an internal organ. And here on the left side, you can see the typical um, locations of, of uh, the 
dermatome. So that is for the heart, for example, or here for the gallbladder and so on. For each organ, we, we have the uh, related dermatome where then the symptoms can occur. Or another mixed reflex could be the defense muscular. That means the contraction of the abdominal muscles in case of an appendicitis, for example, so in an inflammation of, of an organ. Or neck stiffness during meningitis. That's also a viscerosomatic reflex. That means that we have a contraction of a skeletal muscle um, as a consequence of a um, disease of an organ or inflammation of an organ. Or in case of the cutaneous visceral reflex, it um, uh, happens that a warm compress can, for example, relieve a colic spasm. So can influence the uh, uh, contraction of a, of a smooth muscle. So uh, at the end, I show you again this table. So uh, what we actually discussed today, so proprioceptive reflexes. So these are monosynaptic with thick uh, afferents and efferents and the receptors and effectors are located in the muscle. In case of the nociceptive reflexes, the uh, receptors are found in the skin and uh, but the effectors are again the skeletal muscles, and this reflex is polysynaptic. In case of the autonomic reflexes, the uh, receptors are mostly located in the internal organs, and the uh, effectors are not the skeletal muscles, but smooth muscles, cardiac muscle, or glands, and that is also polysynaptic. And in case of, of the mixed reflexes, uh, the receptors can be bo uh, located both in the skin or in the internal or both the skeletal and the smooth muscles uh, can function as the effector. And this is also a polysynaptic reflex. Okay, so thank you for your attention. If you have questions, please ask your questions at the end. Otherwise, thank you again.